All righty, everybody. I just got our, our okay to start our planetarium show. So I'm going to be putting away our space trivia questions because now we're going to be heading into the unknown. Ooh. And welcome, welcome, everyone, to the Morrison Planetarium. Uh, really quickly, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Christian. I want to be your planetarium presenter. And just a heads up, I'm not just a voice coming out of the walls. I'm actually a person. I'm standing right behind you. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> uh, don't hurt your necks. Look forward into the dome before you. That's where the whole show is going to be. I just want to let you know that I'm an actual person, and I'm going to be uh, doing this show for you today. And also, I want to let you know that everything that you see in purple right now is going to be one enormous screen, thanks to the help of six different projectors hidden throughout our planetarium dome. If you're looking for those projector systems, they're hidden just below that purple glow. And folks, I'm very excited to have y'all here for the last planetarium show of the day because this one's different from all the other ones that we've done here so far. This one's called Tour of the Universe, and it's my absolute favorite because this show is completely live, so you're going to hear my voice for the next 30 minutes. And uh, pretty much what the show entails, well, we're going to be starting off pretty close to the Earth, and we're going to be zooming all the way out to the very edge of the observable universe. So hopefully by the end of the show, you won't have an existential crisis of where we are in space. <laughs> but just a heads up, uh, we're pretty small in the grand scheme of things, so just a forewarning. But before we get started, I do have to go over some quick house rules just so that we're all on the same page and have an enjoyable time. There's a few of us in here. Uh, first off, there's no food or drinks allowed in. If you have any snacks, please put those away until the end of the show. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Also, if you have any cell phones, smartwatches, now's the time to turn them off, put them away for the next 30 minutes. These devices really take away from the planetarium show because uh, this room's going to get quite dark. And also, folks, if you need to exit early during our show, you're more than welcome to do so. All we ask is that you exit towards the top of the planetarium. That's where you're going to find the exits before, during, and afterwards. So always make your way up the stairs. And if stairs poses a challenge for you, don't worry. Just remain seated throughout the show. Once the show finishes, we'll have a staff member escort you to a lower exit as the show's wrapping up. And last but not least, folks, folks, this show can be quite immersive thanks to our 75-foot dome. If at any point during the show you start to feel overwhelmed, you start to experience motion sensitivity, there's a really quick and easy trick to ground you. All you got to do is close your eyes, take a few big deep breaths, then your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco and not hurtling across the universe, at least not more than the usual. Hee hee hee. But with that being said, it looks like we're ready to go. So I invite you all to sit back, relax, and gaze into the dome before you, because here comes Tour of the Universe. All righty, everybody. As I mentioned, we're going to be starting off pretty close to the planet Earth. Uh, you can kind of see the Earth just down below. You can see some city lights, kind of uh, spotty. But you can also see the curvature of the Earth on the, on the horizon over yonder. And again, we're starting off pretty close to the Earth at this really cool spacecraft in front of us called the International Space Station. Now, a lot of people tend to ask me, hey, Christian, what is the International Space Station? I hear about it all the time in news and articles, but I don't really know what it is. Could you explain it for me? Well, of course, folks. The International Space Station is a research facility, a laboratory that orbits around our planet Earth, and they conduct all different types of science experiments that they're unable to do closer to the planet, which has a lot more gravity. So some of the things that they'll conduct up here are things like what happens when you try to grow plants in space? Do the plants grow the same? Do they grow differently with less gravity? Which way do the roots grow? Um, another one is what happens when you try to spark a match in space? Does the flame act the same? Does that act differently with less gravity? And also, folks, the International Space Station looks really big on our planetarium dome right now, but it's not that big in actuality. It's only about the size of an American football field. So if you've never been to an American football game, don't worry. You can also use the entire California Academy of Sciences, the museum we're sitting in right now. That's about how big it is. And also what's really impressive is that this thing is going incredibly fast. The International Space Station is traveling at a whopping 17,000 miles per hour, where it orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes, and it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Whew, how romantic. And also, this looks really far away from our planet Earth, but the International Space Station isn't too far away. It's only about 225 miles above the surface of our world. 225 miles, that's like going from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, a nice little road trip to get away with the family for the weekend, so not too bad and not too far either. 
But to tell you the truth, folks, this is as far as we put humans out into space nowadays, just because traveling into space is very expensive. Right now, currently, there's 11 astronauts on the International Space Station, and that changes depending on the missions uh, require more astronauts or not. But folks, this is just the first stop on our tour of the universe. So now we're gonna see the International Space Station start to slowly disappear. And as we start to leave our world behind, we're gonna see it uh, disappear to the city lights down below. And before we lose track of it, I wanna add a nice little orbital path so we can keep track as we continue zooming away. Alrighty, folks, we've zoomed so far away now, we're able to look down at our entire planet Earth, and it looks like we're just above Australia. And uh, I want to let you know, folks, that the space program that we're using in here is something that you can go home and download, and you can fly through space just like how I am. The space program that I'm using in the Morrison is something called Open Space. So if you go to your favorite search engine, type in Open Space Project, you'll come across the link where you can download this app or this uh, software. and. Uh, just a heads up, open space uses uh, a whole lot of processing power. So if you have an older computer, I wouldn't recommend downloading it. It may overwhelm that computer. Also, open space is in its beta phase, which means it's not completely finished. We may come across a bug or a glitch here and there. If we do, I'll point it out and hopefully we can look past that. But also, if you're a person like me that doesn't want to download anything, or you just don't have the space for it, because I never delete anything, well, we also have another great alternative called NASA's Eyes. So if you go to your favorite search engine, type in NASA's Eyes, like the human eyeball, you can uh, go to a link and then just fly through space without having to download anything, and it's so much fun. So we got Open Space Project and NASA's Eyes. But now that we got a good sense of what we're using in here, let's make our way over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. Now, folks, we humans have been to the moon before, but that was a little while ago. That was between 1969 and 1972, thanks to NASA's six Apollo space missions that, uh, that brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon. They got to conduct science, and of course, they had some fun. They got to play some golf up here as well. And folks, when we look at the moon here on Earth, sometimes the moon feels incredibly close to us. It feels like you can reach out your arms and touch it but the moon is incredibly far away from us. It's about 240,000 miles away from our planet Earth. Whew, 240,000 miles. Some of the adults in this room may have a car with that many miles on it. And if you take better care of your car than I do, you can even imagine driving to the moon if you drove for about four months nonstop going about 80 miles per hour. Although I wouldn't recommend it, the roads out here are poorly maintained. Hee hee hee. And from here on now, folks, we're going to need to use a more useful measuring stick because at this scale, using miles, it's kind of like using inches to describe the distances between cities because space is so big. So astronomers use a more convenient measurement known as light speed. And light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. That's roughly about 300,000 kilometers per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and further than any human has done so or since, it only takes light one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's kind of like a short pause in conversation. But alas, folks, it is time for us to leave the moon behind. So everybody say, bye-bye, moon. We'll see you later. <laughs> so cute. And now, folks, we're going to see the moon and the Earth as they start to slowly disappear. And again, before we lose track of them, I want to add some nice little planet trails, because again, space is so big, you can easily lose stuff out here. And folks, on our journey, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light. We're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination, thanks to the help of computer models like Open Space, showing us the most accurate images and information available to us. And now, the nearest star to us, the sun, should be coming into view. So uh, here comes the sun. Do, 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 do. And folks, our sun is also incredibly far away from us uh, here from Earth. The sun's about 93 million miles away. Whew, 93 million miles. That is a good distance away. Again, we're the third rock from the sun, so we have one, 
two, three, that's us, 93 million miles between us. In terms of the speed of light, that's not too far away because in order for sunlight to travel that distance, it only takes sunlight about eight and a half minutes at the speed of light to cross that 93 million miles, so not too far away. But now that we have a nice bird's eye sense of our solar system, let's do a quick refresher of what's here, shall we? Right in the middle, we have our star of the sun, the biggest thing by far. The closest planet to the sun, we have Mercury. And then the next planet over, we have Venus. And then after that, we got Earth. That's us. And of course, we have Mars right afterward, the red planet. And then past Mars, we have this really cool feature called the main asteroid belts. And this is what it would look like if we were to highlight all the asteroids in our asteroid belt. There is a lot of them. And then past the asteroid belt, we have the really big planets, the gas giants. We've got the Jovians. We have Jupiter, the biggest of them all, and Saturn, famous for its rings. And then now we're coming to the outer part of our solar system, and we're going to come across the icy gas giants. We have Uranus, the funny one, and Neptune. And of course, of course, we can always add everyone's favorite and lovable dwarf planet, Pluto. So here comes the orbit of Pluto on screen. And Pluto hangs out here in this outer part of our solar system called the Kuiper Belt. And you're probably wondering, what's the Kuiper Belt? I've never heard of that before. Well, folks, the Kuiper Belt is going to be all this stuff. So pretty much the Kuiper Belt is the second asteroid belt all the way out here past the orbit of Neptune. And mostly what you're going to find here are icy asteroids and short period comets. Comets that don't stray too far away from the sun. They have a nice little short uh, orbit just like so. But I want to put away the Kuiper Belt because that's just a whole lot to look at. And now, folks, on screen, I'm going to be adding uh, the many different spacecrafts we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system. So on screen now, we have the trajectories of Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2, and the latest of them all, New Horizons, which did a quick flyby of Pluto in 2015. We can see that interaction right over here. Now, just to let you know, all these spacecrafts are all traveling fast enough to escape the sun's gravity and leave our solar system behind. But even the most distant of these robot adventurers, Voyager 1, has not traveled as far as light travels in a single day. In order for sunlight to travel all the way out to the orbit of Pluto, takes sunlight about five hours at the speed of light. Five hours, not too bad either. But folks, it's time for us to leave our planetary scale behind because now we're going to be heading into interstellar space, the space between the stars. Distance now becomes so immense, it's going to take us about four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us, the Alpha Centauri system. And it looks like Alpha Centauri is just on our right-hand side. So we're right smack in the middle of our screen. A little bit to the right, you can see a star slightly moving. That's Alpha Centauri right there. Now again, four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us. But that doesn't really put into perspective of how long it would take us humans to travel that far. Well, folks, if you were to jump in a rocket ship today, left planet Earth, make your way over to Alpha Centauri. It's going to take you about 8,500 years to cross that distance. Whew, and that's just a one-way trip. But folks, let's stop and consider whether humanity has made its presence known out here in the universe, because now we're going to be stepping inside something called the radiosphere. So again, we're now inside something called the radiosphere, and this represents the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted or rather leaked into space. And it extends about 90 light years in all directions emitting out from the Earth. This first began in the early 1930s with strong radio waves, early television, radar signal, and then later the detonation of atomic weapons. All this stuff is emitting electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. And humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. And since all these signals are electromagnetic, they are traveling at the speed of light. So this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, the radiosphere is always expanding at the rate of one light year per year. So is anybody out there listening? And right now, folks, I'm going to be adding some many markers onto the screen. 
These many markers indicate um, some of the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 30 years, which has at least one or more planets orbiting around them. We call these planets exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. Our technology is not able to answer that question quite yet, but new generations of astronomical instruments are devoted for that search. And the more important point here is that quite a few of these planetary systems are within that 90 light year limit of our radio sphere and could have potentially received our signal. However, since radio, radio, radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody that's out there able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. Now, to give you an example, let's say we live in a star system on our left-hand side right over here. Let's say that star system, we find an alien civilization somewhere on the, on the right-hand side. Let's say this one. And uh, let's say we want to shoot them a text message. We say, hey, we're humans. We live here. We shoot them a text message. It takes 60 years to get to them. They listen in, answer back another 60 years for that message. Folks, that is a 120-year conversation in the making. Whew. And I can barely wait for a text message from my friend. But of course, folks, planetary systems beyond the radio sphere, more than 90 light years away, have not heard from us yet, but eventually they will, as the radio sphere is always growing, but it becomes weaker as it does. And for now, I'm going to be putting away our exoplanet markers. And I want to leave our radio sphere up on screen, because as huge as humanity's electromagnetic footprint is, it is nothing compared to our Milky Way galaxy. So keep your eye on that radio sphere as we continue zooming out. Alrighty, everybody, we've zoomed so far out. Now we're able to look down on our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And I've got to ask real quick, can anybody see their house from here? <laughs> Just kidding. And folks, our Milky Way galaxy is incredibly large. If you wanted to cross it from one side to the other, it's going to take you about 130,000 years at the speed of light. 130,000 years. Whew, that's big. And folks, the Milky Way is so huge, we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in our galaxy. If our recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within our small neighborhood within this vast star city is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our sequel galaxy. And just really quickly, I want to show you what it looks like from a sideways perspective. You're going to notice that our galaxy kind of looks like a big flat pancake from a sideways point of view. And that's important because when scientists and astronomers want to learn about the universe, it's much more easier for them to point their telescopes galactically north and galactically south. Instead of looking through the plane of the Milky Way, which has planets, stars, gas, debris, things that block their view of the universe. So again, keep that in mind. We like to point our telescopes galactically north and south. That's going to come important just a little bit. But folks, the Milky Way galaxy is only one of many hundreds of billions of galaxies that comprise the known universe. So in this giant leap, every single point of light that you're now going to see no longer represents a star. Instead, it represents the location of an individual galaxy, each galaxy containing hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of stars. And we live in a local galaxy group which contains about 30 galaxies large and small. Also includes the nearest large spiral to us, the Andromeda Galaxy, only 2 million light years away, just next door and heading right for us. We're going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years, so mark your calendars. And as we continue zooming out, folks, you're now going to realize that galaxies are not evenly distributed throughout space. Instead, galaxies like to clump together in large groups and clusters, or they like to avoid each other where there's very few galaxies or no galaxies at all. So we can see a nice galaxy clustering over here, some galaxy clustering over there in the back. We can see very few galaxies towards the top or no galaxies at all. You can kind of think of galaxies like people. They like to hang out together or they like to avoid each other. And folks, we zoom so far back now that this picture that we're looking at represents the closest 30,000 galaxies to us over a space 300 million light years across. We got to give thanks to an amazing researcher and astronomer by the name of Dr. Brent Tolley, who compiled this representation thanks to the work of a dozen other astronomers working aside him over decades of time. So big shout out to Dr. Brent Tolley. I love flying through this galactic map. But folks, now we have automated systems that are mapping even the most distant galaxies. 
folks, we're now able to see the very large scale structure of the universe. And remember, every single point of light that you're seeing, that's not a star, that's an individual galaxy. Whew, I feel small. And just a heads up, folks, the large scale structure of the universe is not in the shape of a bow tie or a butterfly as we spin around. Remember when I just mentioned that we live in a flat spiral disk of the Milky Way? Well, if we were to line up our galaxy, it would line up just down the middle like so. So again, we like to point our telescopes galactically north and south. And uh, astronomers still want to make sure that there was galaxies through the plane of our Milky Way galaxy, so they have this nice purple survey of galaxies. You'll notice that they were still able to find them, just not as many and not as far. Pretty much, we have to wait for our technology to improve, and once that happens, we'll be able to map out all these areas that we haven't filled in yet, so it's just a matter of time. But we must continue pressing on, folks, because now we're going to be encountering these really distant, faraway objects known as the quasars on the edge of the large-scale structure of the universe, and the quasars are going to appear in orange on either sides. All right, so now we're looking at the quasars, and quasars are short for quasi-stellar radio sources. And these blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenager version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So let's press back to a time before quasars, before planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form. Folks, we're about to see the very edge of the observable universe. So here we are, folks, at the very edge of the observable universe. And what we're looking at is something called the Cosmic Microwave Background Image, or the C CMB image for short. Now, all evidence indicates that the universe that we live in is about 13.8 billion years old. And this is data compiled by Planck and other radio telescopes. And the picture is a very baby version of the universe, only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And it's not a typical photo either. Instead, this is a temperature density image where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color coded with the lighter areas corresponding to the hottest, hottest, least dense regions and the darker areas, the coolest, densest region. These fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But these tiny differences eventually gave rise to that large scale structure of the universe that we saw moments ago, that clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. Figuring out just how that happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, folks, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe, stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, we've traveled as far back as the, the laws of physics can physically allow us to go, so we only have one direction left to go, and that's going to be back towards planet Earth. So let's make our return trip back to planet Earth, y'all. All righty, everybody. We're across an expanse of over 13 billion light years. We present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart. Now, we live in a golden age of astronomy with new generations of telescopes and spacecrafts that are extending the reaches of our eyes, preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. And with that thought, I want to remind you all that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders of our universe. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to peer into their telescopes and see into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. Now, astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. But hey, look at that. Looks like we're making our way back into our Milky Way galaxy. We're heading straight for that radio sphere the furthest our human communications have traveled out into space.
And we're now making our way back to our solar system, our little neighborhood out in the universe. And now, folks, we're about to pass those spacecrafts we sent down in the 1970s to explore our solar system, passing the orbit of Pluto and the Kuiper Belt, and making our way to the third rock from the sun, our home world, planet Earth. All the people that we know, everyone that we ever love, or we, all the people that we love, and everyone that we ever learned about in history class all lived on this one planet, our pale little blue dot. And now we're about to pass the orbit of the moon, the furthest we've ever sent humans out into outer space. And as we make our final approach back to planet Earth, folks, this is going to be the end of our Tour of the Universe show. And I want to thank you all for stopping by and watching it with us today. I hope you did enjoy it. But hey, look at that. We made it back safe and sound back to planet Earth, which is home. And with that being said, folks, that's going to be the end of our Tour of the Universe show. And I want to thank you all for stopping by. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Take care.